Hosea 2, verses 16 to 25, the reconciliation. Assuredly, I will speak coaxingly to her and lead her through the wilderness and speak to her tenderly. I will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of Ahor as a plowland of hope. And there she shall respond as in the days of her youth when she came up from the land of Egypt. So the period of the exodus and wandering is, is romantically imagined and as this time of a very good and close relationship between God and Israel. And in that day you will call me Ishi, and no more will you call me Baali. This is a pun. Both of these words can mean my husband. Ishi is my man, a male, and Baali is my lord. Women would have used both for their husbands. But Baal obviously has connotations with the god Baal. So instead of calling me Baali, my Baal, you will call me Ishi, my husband, using a word that's free of Baal connotations. For I will remove the names of the Baalim from her mouth, and they shall never more be mentioned by name. In that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, and the birds of the air, and the creeping things of the ground, and I will banish bow and sword and war from the land. And thus I will let them lie down in safety, and I will espouse you forever. Back to the marriage metaphor. I will espouse you with righteousness and justice and with goodness and mercy, and I will espouse you with faithfulness, and then you shall be devoted to the Lord. In that day I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the sky, and it shall respond to the earth. And the earth shall respond with new grain and wine and oil. And they shall respond to Jezreel, the first of the children. I will sow her in the land as my own. Jezreel was a fertile valley, not just a place of war and death. And I will take lo ruchama, not loved, back in favor. And I will say to lo ami, not my people, you are my people. And he will respond, you are my God. So Hosea isn't unrelievedly gloomy and grim. It does provide these images, these very stirring images of hope and consolation and reconciliation. Amos also held out hope in the form of a remnant that would survive the inevitable destruction. So we need to think about the two traditions that prophets like Amos and Hosea are drawing on in this combined message of doom on the one hand and hope on the other. Really what the prophets are doing is drawing on two conceptions of covenant, the two con conceptions that we saw in our study of the Pentateuchal material and on into Samuel. On the one hand, they recognize the unconditional and eternal irrevocable covenant right, that God established with the patriarchs as well as the eternal covenant with David, with the house of David. Those covenants were the basis for the belief that God would never forsake his people. But on the other hand, of course, they place emphasis on the covenant at Sinai. It's a conditional covenant. It requires the people's obedience to moral, religious, and civil laws in the covenant code. And it threatens punishment for their violation. So the prophets are playing with both of these themes. Israel has violated the Sinaitic covenant, and the curses that are stipulated by the covenant must follow. National destruction and even exile. They will follow. They have to. But alienation from God is not and never will be complete and irreparable because of the unconditional covenant, the covenant with the patriarchs, the covenant with the house of David. So Israel will be God's people forever despite temporary alienations.